Oh yeah, sure. Look, so I like this deal. I, I like Broadcom's M and A strategy in general. I always say, I want to see them buy stuff. They're good at it. They haven't done a bad deal, software or otherwise. And I'm, I mean, they've grown free cash flow organically and, and, and inorganically, something like a 40% plus CAGR over the last five years through this process. I mean, it's been amazing. This deal was kind of transformational to the software business in the same sense that maybe the original Broadcom deal five or six years back was sort of transformational to the semiconductor business. As you mentioned, this gives them scale. It triples the size of their, of their software business. Um, it, it makes it almost 50% of their revenue. It gives them more of an attack into like the, the, the longer tail of enterprise customers. VMware has a very large channel that now they can actually leverage across the rest of the software business. I think it's very, very creative, especially on the pro formers, but I, I typically trust Broadcom's pro formers. They tend to be pretty conservative. This is easily going to be double digit accretive. Um, it's going to be easily double digit cash on cash return. Um, yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. You ever worry, you know, uh, the history of serial acquirers is you have to keep doing a bigger and bigger deal. The next one's got to be even bigger. And when the music stops, suddenly, you know, margins aren't what they once seemed to be and stocks often fall. Look, it's happened before. Um, and we, we've had that's part of like the, the bear case on Broadcom as it is. I think Broadcom's okay. Look, I've done work in the past. There used to be a thesis. They're not growing organically, so they're buying stuff to plug the holes when they were just doing semis. We've done work on that. They were growing organically just fine. And all the semi growth, like since they pretty much bought Broadcom, has been organic and it's been phenomenal. And the same thing on the software business. You know, it's they're running these things differently than software companies tend to do. They, you know, Hawk, you got to remember, Hawk 10 does not care about growth. So he's not looking to plug holes to drive growth. He doesn't care about growth, he cares about cash flow and return and the way he runs these businesses and the types of things he's buy sticky, mission critical enterprise software that is not going anywhere. I think you can build sustainable franchises on, on the back of that. And that's that's what they're doing. That's what, so no, I, I don't really worry about that. Some investors do, I don't worry about that. Stacey, David brought up some possible pitfalls when it comes to getting this deal through regulators. Yeah. Obviously, the Trump administration had previously blocked Broadcom's purchase of Qualcomm in 2018. We have a different administration, yes. but certainly a lot of volatility in the world and other reasons potentially to be skeptical. What do you yeah, think well, the risks are to this being completed? So you're right. So there's no real fundamental reason why it shouldn't. But to your point earlier, we may not be in, in that kind of a regime anymore. And, and Broadcom, like they're not entirely beloved of the regulators all the time, as you mentioned. They just settled an FTC case with some other stuff. Um, with Qualcomm and Cifius was a little different. So Cifius did intervene with Qualcomm, although even there, I think the jurisdiction was fairly tenuous. But at that point, Broadcom was still Singaporean domiciled for tax reasons. They were actually in the process of redomiciling back to the U.S. And that was Hawk's one mistake, I think, with the Qualcomm deal, was not waiting until that redomiciling was complete before launching the bid. And so because they were still in Singapore, they were technically a foreign company. CFIUS back then, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, had a, had a handhold on it. They're a U.S. company right now. VMware is a U.S. company. At least CFIUS, I don't think, has any or shouldn't have any jurisdiction here at all. Um, we'll see about the rest of it, you know, and you know the FTC and everything else. But there's no real overlap here, here either. So there's no fundamental reason why it shouldn't happen. In this environment, though, we'll we'll see. We'll see. I don't know, <laughs> but I think it'll be okay. Hey, Stacy, did you cut your numbers on Nvidia? And what do you make of the turnaround this morning from the pre-market, both on Nvidia and uh, yeah. by extension on AMD? Yeah. So we actually cut our numbers earlier in the week. Just you know, investors, my, my incoming on, on Nvidia has been very consistent. Lots of incoming questions long-term on data center and lots of short-term questions on gaming. So I think investors want to own that data center story, but they've been very nervous about some of the, the potential near-term dynamics in, in gaming. Um, and so we cut our numbers, our gaming numbers, early this week. And my, my numbers after last night barely changed um, because of that. We did actually get a cut in gaming. Now, they're blaming China COVID lockdowns and Russia. But it was a fairly sizable gaming cut. So investors who were actually looking for a, a, a reset in extra for gaming actually got that. And the data center business was really strong. So the, the data center in the quarter came in great. And the implied guidance for next quarter, I think, for data center was well above the street. So for investors who were looking for a strong data center story to own and ideally a reset in gaming expectations, they, they got that. And I think that's why the stocks actually responded to it. They, even though I do think street numbers are going to come down. I, I, ho I hope they come down. I want them to. Um, that gives people a, a de-risk profile that they can buy. And I think they're doing that. Yeah, and Stacy, finally, there is a 40-day go shop in the Broadcom deal. Any imagine? Could you imagine anybody else stepping in there who might, you know, see it as an opportunity? 
you know, the usual names of the three, you mentioned Cisco. Again, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm not speculating on, on hypothetical m and here. I don't really like to do that in the press, but some of the names that have been tossed out in my conversation, Cisco is certainly one there. You know, there's Oracle, even some of the cloud guys sometimes, you know, like the Amazons or the Googles, they, uh, tossed out as like potential, like like maybe, but like we'll, we'll see. At the same time, you got, you know, VM reported this morning too, like the VM quarter was not super. Right? Right. Um, maybe it's clear, you know, why they're, Sell it. I, I don't know, right? But like, just in general, like the, the dynamics in the VMware business at Stand Today, just based on today's results, were not super. So, yeah, actually, I'm glad you pointed that out. It, important point, and unlikely we see somebody jump it, but you never know. Stacy, thank you. You never know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, you never know. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.